Okay, uh, we're really happy to have Jerry Cummings with us today. He's from Norton, Kansas. Where's your church? Living Hope Living Fellowship. Fellowship. Yeah, out there. He's also the head of the International Association of Ministries, which is, we are a part of it, and uh, very blessed to be a part of it. And their meetings are in Minneapolis uh, starting tomorrow. And so um, he was coming up to Kendall's up. So asked him a year ago yeah. already he was going to be up for another thing, and that didn't work out so Glad this works out. He's been a real precious brother uh, in the Lord. He used to be up here by Bayfield. Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne, yeah. And, uh, but, I don't know, the weather up there wasn't the best, so he went to camp. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you get cold up there now. We do, but then it gets hot the next day. No. <laughs> okay, Jerry, all your Lord bless you. Am I on? I don't know. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I think so. Well, thank you, Pastor Wayne and Karen, for uh, the privilege of sharing the Word of God. Um, it's a privilege to speak the Word of the Lord. It's a privilege to speak the name of... I'm not on? You're not. I'm not on. Okay. Am I on now? Yep. Okay. You know, I hear stories of missionaries going to places where people have never heard and never had the opportunity to have the name Jesus come over their lips. And I think, oh my goodness, we are so privileged to have Jesus and to, you know, the things that we take for granted so much. And I'm so thankful for that. And I'm thankful for the, the, the privilege of ministering the Word of God. And, uh, you know, the Lord was, you know, sometimes you deal with things in ministry. And uh, a few weeks ago, the Lord, uh, the Spirit of God moved on me and said, you need to thank God for your ministry. You know, just like Paul did. And you need to give thanks. And... Uh, Sometimes there's wonderful times, sometimes there's times that aren't so wonderful, but we are privileged to speak the Word of God. Amen. And uh, good to have Rod, Ruth, and Ryan, close, very close relatives. <laughs> um, Rod is my uh, wife's younger brother. Notice I got the younger part in there. And uh, so we appreciate you coming on, coming over today. Um, I want to share a word today, um, and some of the passages you may want to look up, others you may just want to listen because there's some individual verses that we're not going to have time to scramble back and forth on. Um, but I want to speak today on being convinced of what we know. Being convinced of what we know, it's a big deal. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 23, and just the last half of that verse, it says, Then you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. Then you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. Now the Lord was speaking here through the prophet Isaiah to some people that knew that God was the Lord. They were aware of that fact. It was not new information to them. But he said, I'm going to do some things in time, and when I do those things, you'll know that I'm the Lord. In other words, he's going to take your knowing and take it deeper. A deeper level of knowing than just saying, I know, or I have information. And we were sharing about the baptism in the Holy Spirit in Sunday school. And I remember I grew up in a Christian home and uh, had a lot of Bible information that I grew up with, a lot of Bible concepts. But something happened when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. There was a knowing of these basic realities that it, somehow it went 
deeper than it had been. The knowing got deeper. And that's part of the work of the Holy Spirit is to bring a knowing of the things of God at a deeper level. And God is desiring and at work to bring that about. And so, oftentimes we focus on the amount of content of the things of God. You know, we, we, we take people through training, discipleship, and so on, and we give this information, we give this information, we give this information, and sometimes we just keep giving more and more and more information. But what we're talking about today is taking the things that we do know and having it go deep. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. And I, I want to mention one thing before we read that. You know, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. And I realized one time that that doesn't mean that he's going to take everything that is true in the universe and show us all of it. None of us is going to know everything that is true. But it says he will guide us into all truth. There's a difference between having the truth and being in it. And the Holy Spirit wants to take what is true and bring us into the reality of that truth. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given up to us by God. So the Holy Spirit comes so that we can know. Not just as information, but as certainty that goes deep. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit our guarantee. 2 Corinthians 1.22 who has also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given the Spirit as a guarantee. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy <coughs> Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So God gives us his Holy Spirit and says, here's my down payment, here's my guarantee. You see? And, you know, if somebody, if you go to purchase something and they require a down payment, what is that for? It's to guarantee to them that you're going to come through with the rest. And the Bible says that God gives us His Holy Spirit, and that Spirit is a guarantee that He's going to come through with the rest of what He's promised us, the full inheritance. Now, is it a guarantee so that God's going to keep His word? No. Why would God give a guarantee? Because he's concerned about the certainty in our hearts. He, want, he does stuff all the time to take us from knowing to really knowing. You know, God went through an elaborate covenant with Abraham. And some of you have read the covenant that God made with Abraham. And, uh, and when God made this covenant and there were these promises he made to Abraham, God made a covenant and it was very elaborate you know, he says, Abraham, take these different animals. There was a dove, there was a cow, a sheep, or I don't know. There was like four different animals. And he said, split them in half. And so Abraham did prepare it like God had said. And he had to wait and wait and wait. Finally, God showed up. It was after dark. And there was a light, which was God. There was a light that passed between the carcasses. That's weird. But it would be weird right now. Don't be doing that. Um, <laughs> um, but see, this was a covenant. 
And what that covenant meant was the person who, who cut that covenant in two, what they were saying was, may God do to me what has happened to these animals if I don't keep my commitment in this covenant. And God himself, to demonstrate something to Abraham, to put a certainty down, way down deep inside of Abraham, he went through this process and cut this covenant all, not so he would keep his word, but so Abraham would have a certainty. And there's so many things that God does, even today, in our lives, because he's wanting to make us more and more certain. John said, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You're aware that you have eternal life in Christ? Well, he says, I want you to really know. I want you to know that you know that you know. So that's why I'm writing these things, John says. Why is it so important? Let's go back to a verse that you all know, probably. Hebrews 11, 1, and this is in the New American Standard. I, most of mine is in the New King James. This is from the New, the New American Standard. It says, Now faith is the certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen. And then he goes on to tell all the awesome things that have taken place through faith. <coughs> in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. But he starts out, Faith is the certainty things hoped for. Faith is the certainty of things hoped for. Faith is the certainty of things hoped for. Faith is the certainty of things hoped for. If faith is a key that the Bible says it is, and if faith is a certainty, then how important is it that God take the things that we know and take them deeper and deeper until we are deeply convinced in our lives. There's a power in knowing a few things deeply versus knowing a lot of things to a shallow degree. We can know things as people who have been informed, but not have been convinced. The depth of our conviction, now we use the word conviction in terms of sin, but it simply means convinced. And the Spirit convinces us when we sin, but He also convinces us of other truth. And um, the depth of our conviction of God's truth determines the depth of the reality that we live in. The breadth of knowledge without a depth of knowledge is powerless. We are very impressed when people have a large quantity of knowledge, and that's not a bad thing. I, I appreciate it too. But we get very impressed when people know tons of stuff. But there's no power in simply knowing a lot of stuff. You can impress people, but there's not power in that. The power is in knowing it deeply and being convinced at a deep level. You see, I believe that most of us as Christians, and I'm not against information, I mean, I, I, I'm a teacher, okay? <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I appreciate it. It's, it. You know, it's just it's gifting, it's just what I do, it's how I think, and so on. But, I believe that most of us would be better off knowing half as much, but twice as deep than we do. There would be much more effectiveness and reality.
Um, there's a lot of things I could say, but um, I'm not limited here. Um, the Holy Spirit we talked about is the one who ministers uh, conviction of truth. <coughs> one thing I want to mention is um, it's important to understand that God reveals himself through his interventions, not through his silence. Now, the reason, I, the reason this is important in this context is because we go through periods in our life where we see the hand of God. And we go through periods of time where we're not seeing a lot. Okay? And the verse that we started with said, Then you will know that I am the Lord, because they will not be ashamed who wait for me. In other words, you're going to wait a while. And then I'm going to answer. And that answer that has come after waiting is going to convince you at a deeper level. You know, the Bible says um, in Proverbs, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. And that's one of the ways that God uses to convince us. He doesn't wait or delay simply to bring doubt, but because he knows the sweetness and the depth of impact that will come when we've waited, we've believed, we've waited, we've believed, we've waited, and then it comes. He knows that impacts us, and the next, it's like, we know now. We know now. And uh, um, so God works in this way of, of sometimes delaying because of the sweetness that comes when the answer comes. One more portion. Um, we're going to turn to Mark in a moment the book of Mark um, but we, there is the impact of the scriptures of course there's the spirit of revelation that takes us deeper in our convincing there's, there's a difference when the spirit of revelation is on something um, you know did you ever have a portion of scripture and then God, you know, it's, it's something you've read, but now God reveals something that brings a, a knowing, a convincing. Um, there's two or three witnesses. When we hear the testimony from somebody, when we experience something, and then we read it in Scripture, and then we hear it preach, and then the Holy Spirit ministers it to us, there's a, a growing depth of conviction. <clears throat> there's the fellowship of faith where we mix with people who are people of conviction. Sometimes the worship brings the knowing deeper. Um, you know, one of the things I believe important about the worship that we do, um, oftentimes, you know, information will train our mind, but music teaches the heart. And that's very, very important because that's where our conviction is. There's also the confession, the confession of faith. Um, we speak what we're convinced of, but also what we speak, we begin to be convinced of. And I don't mean that it's just, you know, I had an uncle who, who had been a believer, but totally rejected it, but he was a professor of communications in Oklahoma. And even as an unbeliever, he said, you know, these people in the historical church, 
you know, when they did all these confessions that people would repeat, he said, you know, they had something. He said, I don't believe what they said, but, but they had something. He said, people become to believe what they speak. Okay? And it's not that we want to fake stuff, but we also want, if we speak in accordance with the truth, spoken word will begin to convince our hearts. And then when we speak out of a convinced heart, there's power. All right. The last item I want to bring forth here is Mark chapter 8. And this has to do with having a heart that is impressionable. Mark 8, verse 13. He left them and getting into the boat, again, Mark 8, 13, getting into the boat, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have had no bread. Now do you know what just had happened? They had just fed 4,000 with a few loaves and fish, and just before that they fed 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes. And Jesus gets in and he starts talking about yeast, and they say, oh, Jesus is not happy because we didn't bring bread. <laughs> See? And Jesus said, why is not having bread an issue for you guys. <coughs> Didn't what happened make an impact? Didn't the miracles impact you and your thinking? See, we a lot of times, we see the, the wonderful works of God, and then we walk away and we say, well, but you never know what God might do. When in reality, God is wanting us to see his miracles and see what he does and say, ah, that's what God will do. Um, and so he says, verse uh, 17, Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, why do you reason because you have not bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Is your heart still hardened? Isn't that interesting? He asked his disciples, these are the good guys, these are the cream of the crop, you know, these are the guys that he's pinning everything on for the spread of the gospel, and uh, they've been living with him, and he says, are your hearts still hardened? See, this wasn't the hardness of heart that Pharaoh had, where Pharaoh was set himself against um, what God was saying. It wasn't that type of hardness. It wasn't the hardness of rebellion. But the hardness was, he's saying, are your hearts so unable to be impacted? You know? If you, um, you know, if you, if, you, if you push your thumb into a soft piece of clay, what happens? It leaves the impression of your thumb. Okay. You push your thumb in after that clay has been baked into a piece of pottery. If you push your thumb, it doesn't leave any impression. And that's what, what, what Jesus is saying to the disciples. Are your hearts still unimpacted? You know? Are your hearts still hard? Okay? And... Jesus desired, desired that these miracles would have impacted them and so that they would know from that point on that bread was not an issue. Okay? We can be in the same position as the disciples. We can have hearts that because of different things, sometimes it's because we've experienced disappointments, and we don't want to be disappointed one more time. 
And so we resist the impact of what God does. does. Um, sometimes we're hardened because we've done things the same way for so many times. It's like the seed that fell on the path. Why was the path hard? The path is hard because they've walked on it so many times. And so when, when the seed comes, it's, it doesn't go in because it's not in line with, you know, it doesn't penetrate. See? So what it's saying here is we need, by the Holy Spirit, we need to consciously cultivate a heart that is impressed that can be impacted by the things of God. And sometimes it takes a, a renewing, sometimes it takes a healing of our hearts, you know? I, I've been there, I, you know, I, I've, I've had times, you know, you prayed for something that didn't happen, prayed for something that didn't happen, and the next time, you know, it's like, you know, you, you got a same situation, you got a promise, and you just kind of, okay, well, we'll see. But God wants to change that. And he wants to give us a tender heart in the sense that we can be, and, and that's one of the important things of, of, of the conviction, being convinced of God, is that our hearts are tender towards the things he says and towards the, the works that he does. Amen? Amen. You know? Can you think of, see, I'm going to end there, but the enemy wants to interpret your history, and so does God. The enemy, you know, did you ever play the dot-to-dot -dot things when you were a kid? Yeah. Yeah, still do. All right. Um, well, I used to do those. I liked them. And... Uh, the enemy wants to come along in our heads and say, you remember when that happened? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And then there was this that happened. Oh. And then there was this that happened. And he starts connecting the dots from the things of our past and tries to draw a picture of who God is mm -hmm. and who you are. But see, God wants to take the testimony of the things he's done. Do you remember when I did this for you? Do you remember what happened over here with this person? You saw what? what